the nurse came up to listen to see if the fetus was still alive. And for a long time, we couldn't hear any fetal heart tones. And then all of a sudden, we heard this strong boop, 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 was the fetal heartbeat. And when you hear that, it changes your perspective. And that's, I left the ICU that night with a different perspective on the right to life. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Rooted in Christ podcast. My name is Eric Stevens. I'm the founder of Redwood Christian Ministries. Hope everyone out there is doing well. With me on the show today, I have a very special guest. I have author, editor, and public speaker, Tracy Crump. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me, Eric. Well, thank you for being on the show. And I apologize for being late. It seems to be the story of my life today. So thank you for your grace and patience. I appreciate it. No problem. So tell me, where'd you grow up and where are you from? Well, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. We lived in Midtown and I lived there for, I guess, oh, 29 years. And then we moved down to North Mississippi. That's where we live now, just South of Memphis. So pretty much in the same area. So where would you say, what would you say your faith journey was, was like, were you always a Christian? Were you always following Christ? Feel free to share any part of your testimony that you like to dive into. Okay. Well, I'd like to say first that I grew up in a very loving family. I had wonderful parents, two sisters, but it was not a Christian family. When I was about 11 years old, I, I went to my mom and dad and asked, why do we not go to church? Can we go, can we start going to church? Cause I had several friends who attended church regularly and they said, well, would you like to know what we believe? And I said, yes. And they sat me down and they said, we, we believe we do, we believe that there may be a God or there may not be a God, but it really doesn't matter to us either way. And they told me that they were agnostic and that's what they believed. And I thought, well, that really doesn't make sense to me, but I was fortunate that they were open to my going to church. So for two years, I walked from our home about a block to a church and attended training union, which is kind of like Sunday school at night. And I kid you not, the couple who led the class that I went to was called Mr. and Mrs. Angel. <laughs> so I, I enjoy going to that class and I told them that I was a Christian. They asked me, you know, what my beliefs were and told them I was a Christian because in my 11 year old mind, you just, if that's what you wanted to be, then that's what you were. So, you know, that's what made sense to me. But I went for about two years, but it, like any children who don't have someone who encouraged them to continue going, I kind of fell away. But I did continue reading my Bible. Now, I was just a voracious reader, and I read the Bible cover to cover twice by the time I was 17. But I still wasn't a Christian. It wasn't until I went to nursing school and someone invited me to a crusade. And there I heard that. All have come short of the glory of God. And everyone is a sinner. And I'm sure I'd heard it before, but it was just kind of like suddenly it clicked. And I thought, oh, yeah, it means me. Everyone means me. And so that's when I, I accepted Jesus into my heart. But Eric, I want to say that, you know, I was always a pretty good girl. You know, I didn't get into trouble. I didn't do drugs or alcohol. I didn't. You know, I wasn't promiscuous, nothing like that. But, you know, being a good person doesn't make you a Christian. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Reading your Bible doesn't make you a Christian. Saying you're a Christian doesn't make you a Christian. I think that is one of the most dangerous places you can be when you believe that you are good enough. And that's really, I think, my parents' belief was that why would God send them to hell, which of course God really doesn't send anyone to hell. It's our sin that does. He will believe that we are good enough because we're never going to be good enough. It's Christ's work on the cross that brings us into righteousness and brings us into heaven. So that is my faith journey. Uh, I will add, and I think we talked about this on the phone one time, that I, even though I was saved at that crusade, I really didn't follow Christ closely then because I didn't have anyone to mentor me. And I take full responsibility for that. I did not seek out a church. I didn't, you know, I didn't really 
make it public that uh, what had happened in my heart. So for years, I did not really follow Christ closely as I should. And that has an effect on you. It really does. But I'm just grateful now that I have a you know, wonderful church family and that we raised our sons eventually. I mean, not at first, but we raised our sons in a Christian home. But anyway, that is my faith journey. I was talking to someone about this yesterday about how no man is good. And this is what this is what Jesus responds to that was when he said, why do you call me good when no one is good except the father above? Hmm. And, you know, my my story and you and I talked about this when we first spoke over the phone. You know, my story is kind of, you know, the opposite of. Of yours. And this is why I say and we say this on this podcast, it feels like weekly, <laughs> but the testimony, there's power in every testimony and your life story and your testimony is for someone else because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But if Christ is doing a work in you and he's doing something in you and through you, you have a story to tell. And if That's Christ right. saw fit to use you, who am I not to share? I don't want to withhold that from someone else, you know? So that's, and you and I think you and I touched on this too, but that's the piece of the great commission that I always really, I really try to hit home with folks that it's disciples who make disciples, but that is doing life together so that we are not out there trying to do it by ourselves. Because if you would have told me, you know, before I got saved, I tell you, I didn't need anybody. You know, I was fine on my own. Mm -hmm. How far from the truth that really was <laughs> and <Right>. still is. <laughs> we need that community. You're right. So you said this really got serious for you when you started going, you know, getting involved in nursing and doing caregiving. So what was that journey like for you? Like how long were you doing healthcare and doing caregiving? How what was that process like for you? Well, I worked in ICU for five years and I loved working as a nurse. I will tell you one story that happened there that I don't tell very often, but I was faced one night with possibility of assisting with an abortion. Uh, now, this was, uh, they were using medication to cause the patient to go into labor. And that really opened my eyes. You know, I had never, because I wasn't raised in a Christian home, I had really never stopped and thought about, you know, the sanctity of life, abortion, and how that affects us. And Roe versus Wade was still fairly fresh at that time. So it, I was, I am, praise God now that the resident on call at the time contacted me. I worked nights and he contacted me and said, I don't want to be woken in the middle of the night. He said, just turn off that drip. I said, Thank you, Lord. But at that time, I had a nurse come up from labor and delivery to listen to, to see this patient had gone through a lot of medication, a lot of x-rays. She was in, in terrible asthma attack and she was on a ventilator. They paralyzed her because she was fighting the ventilator. And so they, the nurse came up to listen to see if the fetus was still alive. And for a long time, we couldn't hear any fetal heart tones. And then all of a sudden, we heard this strong boop, 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 was the fetal heartbeat. And when you hear that, it changes your perspective. And that's, I left the ICU that night with a different perspective on the right to life. But that's, that was just one incident that happened. I also saw quite a few miraculous things. I feel like God saving people's lives that doctors had held no hope for. So it was a really interesting and rewarding career. But after that, my actual heart's desire, as much as I love nursing, was to be a stay-at-home mom. So when I was pregnant with our first child, I was able to stay at home later I, I say God opened a door and pushed me through it, but I became a homeschool mom, which was not something I ever planned to do, uh, but I loved it. We loved teaching our children and once again, raising them in the word, but it was a wonderful experience. And it wasn't until, and you really haven't asked about this yet, but it wasn't until after our boys graduated that uh, I became a writer. And I have to say, I never plan to be a writer, never wanted to be a writer. I hated writing in school. <laughs> so once you know that it's a God thing, <laughs> when you get into something like that and in, end up loving it, but I felt God leading me to write about some issues for parents. And then I didn't know what to do with it. I had, you know, I had no ties to the writing community at all, had no idea what to do. And one day I, uh, this was probably 
four years later, after I, I wrote on these issues, I received a card in the mail advertising a conference, a writer's conference. And so I thought, okay, Lord, I'll just, if that's what you want me to do, I'll just go and I will hand off this manuscript to a willing publisher and he can just run with it and I'll be done with all this writing stuff. But when I got down there, a couple of magazine editors were interested in the topics I was writing about. And so within six months, I was published in national magazines and they even paid me. I thought, well, this is pretty cool. So that's just kind of where I started on that writing career, writing path. What is your, now I'm really just curious because I've talked to so many writers and authors who said the same thing, like, well, I didn't even know I was writing a book or I didn't really want to write or I hated writing. So, and then that's how you know it's God because I'm doing the things that I said I would never end up doing and I'm seeing all the fruit in it because it's him. So what do you enjoy most about the writing process? And then I'm going to add, what do you enjoy the least about it? Well, I, I, I used to like doing the research. I used to enjoy researching. I wrote a lot of articles. Then I began writing devotions. And of course, nothing gets you deeper into God's word than when you're teaching it to someone else. I'm sure you found that to be true. So you you delve deeper into the scriptures when you write devotions. And I love doing that. And I've written a lot of short stories too. And I enjoy doing that. I talk a lot in workshops that I do about the power of story. And I quote a film producer named Peter Goubert, who said, I've come to see that story is far more than entertainment. It is the most effective form of human communication, more powerful than any other way of packaging information. And I do believe that story is powerful. Jesus used story. He told parables all the time. And I call him the master storyteller. So we can mimic him in storytelling and i think we can reach a lot of people that way even devotions usually start out with a personal experience story and that way you you form that connection with the reader right away and that allows you then to go a little deeper into scripture once you have that connection so i think that's a very powerful thing in writing and so that's what i really enjoy doing as far as part that I don't like is it's the marketing. <laughs> a lot of people don't realize that when you write a book nowadays, and I have to say for years, over 15 years, I just wrote short pieces. That's what I enjoy doing. I like to write something and move on to something else. So I really ne- had no plans to write a book. It wasn't until I attended a conference and met up with an agent there. I was telling him about a couple of you know, ideas for fiction books and a children's book. And he said, well, that's all all good and well. But he said, really, nonfiction sells better than fiction. He said, you've written so many devotions. He said, why don't you write a devotional book? And I thought, well, that would be one devotion at a time, <laughs> you know, so I could do that. And uh, but so anyway, we can talk about that later. But the part that I don't like and people don't realize is that you have to market your own book. Yeah. And I'm not good at that. I am not a salesperson. I don't enjoy that part of it. But, you know, even through the marketing, God always brings something good out of everything. And I've, I'll tell to you one story is the my book came out. My book is called Health, Healing and Wholeness, Devotions of Hope in the Midst of Illness. And it's a devotional book. And it came out in the middle of COVID. So I was at the time I was approaching different churches just to see if they would be interested in buying cases of the book. The publisher was offering discounts, hefty discounts and free shipping on cases of them just to use like in outreach or, you know, just for their own parishioners. You know, a lot of people were dealing with COVID or other illnesses. Everybody was isolated. So I had reached out to that church, which by the way, you might recognize the name of the church that I went to when I was a little girl. It's called Bellevue Baptist. That's where Adrian Rogers later became the pastor. And so I reached out to them just to see if they'd be interested. I ended up talking to an older man there, very nice man. And I just went on and told him my testimony, kind of like I just told you. I told him that the people who led that class that I went to was called were called Mr. and Mrs. Angel. And he said, they're still here. He said, they're older than Noah, but he said, they're still here. I said, you're kidding. 
<laughs> so that, that was more than 50 years ago. So that was just a little God wink, I think, right there that he gave me. But anyway, the marketing is not what I enjoy, but God has opened up some really interesting doors more recently because I contacted some uh, cancer treatment centers and asked if they would be willing to make that book available to their patients there. I thought, see, my my desire, my heart's desire was to get this book into the hands of people who needed hope because that's the whole purpose of the hope is of the book is to provide hope. And my first thought was to maybe see if we could get it into gift stores at hospitals because you know, where else are you going to find a lot of people who need, you know, information and hope about illness? But it's very difficult to get into gift stores, hospital gift stores. So I had to abandon that. And then I thought about my cancer treatment centers and places like that, where you have a lot of people who are facing very serious illnesses. And so they, they were open to it. There was a cancer treatment center close to me that was open to it. And I started contacting businesses to see if they could sponsor cases of the book and found several who did. So I was able to take some cases up to the Cancer Treatment Center and also to a ministry who fixes up baskets for people who are starting on chemo. And so that was just a very exciting thing for me. But anyway, the marketing is not the part I like, <laughs> but it's a necessary part. So for the first five people who comment health, healing, and wholeness in the comments, I'm going to get a couple copies of your book to put in their hands. And I'm also just in general going to get a couple of copies from you as well for our outreach efforts, because we've got a few things coming up in my church that I think would come in. I think that book will come in really handy for us. So I may talk to you about that offline about purchasing in bulk. So <laughs> great. Thank you. I will say, I will save the audience that, uh, that conversation. So <laughs> So how did you end up getting into the editing piece of this? Because I'm assuming that when you read my email with the questions that you probably realized how bad the punctuation was <laughs> and everything else. So how did you get into to editing along with what you're doing right now as far as writing and putting books out? Well, it was actually my husband's suggestion. I had led a critique group for years. Uh, and I think it's very important to be in a critique group. And he said, you know, you're so good at that. And English even though I didn't like writing itself, grammar was easy for me. And it was something I kind of enjoyed, although I didn't really think that editing would be my thing. But I got into it and I really enjoy helping people polish their words, making them the best that they can be. Um, one book that I edited near the beginning was for a, a young woman I met at a conference and it's called Kidnapped by a Client. And she was a lawyer is a lawyer and she was kidnapped by a client who took her to a remote spot and planned to rape and kill her and god supernaturally intervened mm. it's she published in the general market not in a christian by a christian publisher but in a general market hopefully to reach more people a wider audience and in that book it's just apparent that god did something supernatural and so it it won a, a starred review from Publishers Weekly, which I understand is a kind of rare thing. Hmm. And so that's kind of one of the books that I'm really proud of. She's become since then a third daughter-in-law to me. But I've been able to help people with both fiction and nonfiction. Yes, nonfiction is probably more my forte, but it's been a lot of fun to do that. So then how did you end up getting involved with Chicken Soup for the Soul and then your Right Life workshops? Like, How did all of that come about? Well, after I published probably the first couple of articles, I joined a writer's group and it was headed up by a lady named Mary Lane Wade Coke. And Mary Lane emailed me one day. She said, Chicken Soup for the Soul is doing a book for the nurse's soul. If you've ever read any chicken soup books, you know, each one has its own little theme. And she knew I had been a nurse years ago. She was, a, she is a nurse. And she said, why don't you try submitting something? And I, chicken Soup's not going to publish anything I write. So I just let that deadline pass. And she emailed a few days later, said, Chicken Soup has extended the deadline for the Nurses Soul book. Why don't you try submitting something? So I thought, gosh, I can't think of anything. And finally, I thought of one story. 
It was the abortion story. And then I thought of another, ended up sending five stories to that book and they chose to publish. And so I always tell people, if I can do it, you can do it. But it's just kind of started a string of acceptances after that. I've published 20 or contributed 22 stories to books, their books since then. And I write or I speak on writing for Chicken Soup with the Soul. Mary Lane and I formed Write Life Workshops and we started doing workshops on writing for them. It's sharing, you know, what we had learned through our experiences and now a mutual friend of ours and I, we will even travel within about five hours of the Memphis area and partner with people who want to bring the workshop to their area. So they've been a lot of fun. We do, it's four and a half, four and a half hour workshop that we do. And I know one lady said, she said, I didn't know how you were going to fill four and a half hours. She said, but I haven't looked at my watch once. Wow. She said, this has been so much fun, but we really enjoy it. We get them started on stories that they can actually submit. So it's a great market for either beginners or experienced writers. You know, you struck gold when they don't even realize the time that's flying by, you know, when it's just like, we've been here for three or four hours and it didn't feel like that. That's really good. <laughs> How mm -hmm. do you, did you say you do that all over the United States or now where do you do these workshops? Well, we usually will just travel within five hours, five, five to six hours of the Memphis area where we can go, you know, drive back and forth. I'm doing one actually in Hattiesburg, Mississippi on September 30th. So that will be our next one. Of course, COVID kind of put a stop to that for a while because we couldn't meet in person. And we did some, well, not podcasts, but webinars at one time. But really the longer workshops, we do so much hands-on material or hands-on activities that it just doesn't lend itself well to doing it online. So we really like the interaction and the attendees do too. So you're the perfect person to ask this question. So if I said this phrase to you, the power of words, what does that mean to you? Well, you know, I think words are what connect us. I have something on my website about Helen Keller. And, you know, of course, she was blind and deaf from a very early age. And she always said that her deafness was what isolated her from other people more than anything else. And so I think words are so powerful. They can be used for good or for bad, for evil. But we have the word now. Some people are visual learners. Some people are auditory learners. I'm so glad that we have the word because I am a visual learner. <laughs> and so that's how I can understand and learn things better. But I just think words are just so powerful to connect us with each other and with God. Um, you know, prayer, Bible reading, that's all so powerful. And as I said, I just think Jesus, you know, Jesus did miracles to prove his deity. But he first used words. He told them about the kingdom of God and he told them about heaven and he told them that he was the son of God. And so I just think that words are just very powerful. If, if I sit on the verse that life and death is on the power of the tongue. And when I get ready to walk out that door, I try to remind myself and I do this, try to do this in prayer daily that I may be the only Christ figure that someone's going to see that day. That's right. So let me give them the best version that, that I can. And why not, why not give someone life if the opportunity is there? Why not show them life if the opportunity is there? Because I don't know what they're going through that day. Yeah. Everybody's facing a battle that we don't know anything about, that they may not be sharing, that we may not even see. So let's just show them and tell them about the love of Christ in any opportunity that we can. Let's not add to what may be going on or what we don't see because there's always something we don't see but we do know that love cover we do know that we can cover them in love and we can shower them in the love of christ so i'm with you i saw that on your website so i wanted you to touch base about that there's also been a, a theme that and you and i talked about this too because there's a verse in ecclesiastes about seasons and it's ecclesiastes i believe it's chapter three verse one and i just wanted you to read that and then share your point of view on that and just expound that in any way that you'd like to right now for the audience. Okay. That's really my life verse. It's to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And I think that, well, you know, my mom actually, she used to say that I was always content being whatever age I was. You know, when you're kids, you want to be older because you get to do this. You want to be 16 so you can drive a car, 18 to do, you know, vote or do whatever. But I was always just content to be the age I was. 
And I think that's kind of, you know, what God said in my heart, set in my heart, because there's a season for everything. I don't know if, I think I've talked with you, Eric, about that, you know, there was a, of course, a season for homeschooling. There was a season for my working as a nurse. Later, I became a caregiver for both my parents and then later for my mother-in-law. And so sometimes those seasons are hard, but they don't last forever. And I just think that God gives us the grace to go through each of those seasons whether they're good seasons or bad seasons, easy seasons or hard season. I think he he gives us the grace to go through those. And I really think sometimes you feel like, oh gosh, this is never going to end. You know, I'm going to feel this way forever. But it's you're not. Everything comes in a season. There is a time for everything. So I just think that is a powerful verse. And I really like that one. I was reading in my devotional this morning that even in those seasons of suffering that he gives us comfort so that we can comfort others. And I think I was reading, I'm going to have to check to see where I was reading that. I have to add that to the comments too. But that was in my devotional this morning. And like you said, it comes in seasons and it is, none of it goes to waste. He works mm-hmm. all things together for the good of those who love him. And it literally means all things. I mean, it's right. So whether it's, it's good the bad. good, it's the bad, it's the, it's the ugly it is, it, he will work all things together for the good of those who love him. So That's right. I don't believe how fast our time today has gone by. This has flown by. I will have to get you back on here again. I would love to just have just to, you know, have you share with our audience again down the road. So, but that brings me to our let them know segment. This is the final segment of the show where you can share anything that you like with the audience, whether it be upcoming speaking engagement, anything else you want to share about your book, how our, the audience can find and support you. But Tracy, please let them know. Okay. Well, I guess I'll talk about what we're working on next. I am working with a co-author. She lives in Kentucky. Uh, we're working on a devotional. Well, we posted it as a devotional book for caregivers. She has been caring for her husband, her name is Diana Derringer, for her husband since 2004. He had a brain tumor diagnosis at that time. And so she is still caregiving. And of course, I mentioned I cared for my mom and dad both before they passed away. And then my mother-in-law, who moved in with us for four years, and she turned 100 before she passed away. So we're working on that book, and we proposed it as a devotional book. But a publisher came back and asked to see it as a Christian living book. Mm. So we've just completed altering or revising the proposal as a Christian living book, which is going to be more in-depth and I hope more beneficial to people. We want to make it practical, but we also want to make it, you know, reach their needs, their spiritual and their, their other needs. So anyway, that's what we're working on right now. We'd love prayer for that because it's a big undertaking for us. And I could say, I'm not a book writer so much as I am short pieces. So this will be an adventure, just like everything else has been. But anyway, maybe I could just read something comes from my introduction from the book that I did, Health, Healing, and Wholeness. I said, in my work as an intensive care nurse, I have watched God perform miracles when everyone else had given up. While we don't always experience physical healing in this life, We can find hope in Jesus, no matter what our situation. Regardless of how things appear now, we can look forward to a glorious future with anticipation and joy in the return of our Savior, when the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. And that's from Malachi 4.2. I say, you know, even though we may not experience physical healing in this life, Jesus stands ready to heal us spiritually anytime we call. That is what he, it's what he does the best. <laughs> and also another verse from Ecclesiastes 3 that I, I really like is he has made everything beautiful in his time. Also has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning to the end. So he, Jesus and God are in our hearts already. I say in our hearts, we have to accept, of course, Jesus is, sacrifice we have to him not only savior but lord of our lives but he is there stands ready for us anytime amen it's one of the things that that i love is even in those because i was talking to someone yesterday and i was like the, the concept of just fear and anxiety just was coming up 
And I was like, you know, this is great that we can talk these things out with each other and hold each other accountable for where we are. But just being able to go to Jesus and just say, this is what I'm going through right now. And I, you know, and just praying and just getting in the word and just realizing like, there are, it's nothing that I'm feeling is uncommon to him, knowing that he can empathize and understand with everything that I'm facing and going through. And he already knows. So just right. taking that time just to be still and commune with him is just, it's been a blessing for the season that I've been in recently. So thank you for sharing that. I have one more thing that I ask every guest to do before I let them go. If you would not mind closing this out in prayer, we would really appreciate it. I would love to. Lord, thank you so much for Eric and for his ministry. Thank you that he has a heart to help others. And Lord, that his willingness to allow people to share their testimonies opens the doors for others to know more about you. And Lord, I just thank you for him. I thank you for your salvation. I thank you for the opportunity to share my testimony, but also what I've experienced through my nursing, my caregiving, and other experiences, life experiences that I've had. Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity to share those things, and I just pray that it will bring hope to others. Thank you again, Lord, for your love, for your mercy, and your grace. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Lord, I just, I thank you for Tracy. I thank you for everything you're doing in her and through her. I thank you for her. Yes. I thank you for her obedience. I pray for her, all of her future and upcoming endeavors. Father, I just pray for open doors, divine appointments. I pray for your favor. I pray that as she's writing and editing, you just give her just the insight that's needed. I thank you that her, her devotionals, her books, everything is going to be in the hands of the people who you want it to be in, Lord. I thank you that you are in control of our lives, Father. I thank you that you've seen the end from the beginning and you know everything that we need and you're going to equip us because you prepared these works in advance for us, Father. So I just thank you for everything you're doing now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Tracy, thank you so much for doing the show today. I look forward to having you back on here in the future. And I also look forward to hearing about your future ride endeavors. You got to keep me posted on how that goes. Thank you so much for having me, Eric. I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much. You have a good day. You too.